uh, for this introduction. Uh, we are really excited today because this team that you are seeing today it has done a tremendous job of uh, finishing a very interesting game plus a course and also uh, with the help of meta uh, engineers and pms we get the chance to include as much as we can everything that you have seen in the last uh, connect and uh, quest 3 features so without further ado i would like to introduce first of all our uh, the team behind this um, course and game sean and steve uh, they are already well known in terms of education and in terms of lots of interesting projects, experiments, crazy experiments. You can already uh, follow them on uh, Reddit or Twitter with very interesting projects. But I will let them to uh, share the, their a little bit of journey and then also what uh, what is waiting for you for the course and for the uh, game. Uh, they are both our master trainers and part of the Pro Collective. So we are really uh, seeing them as a almost like a mastermind for the industry. So, um, Sean, maybe would you like to start first, or uh, Steve? Steve, you are starting first, I think, with the game because everyone is curious about the game, and then uh, after that, after that, we will um, um, maybe let's. Uh, what we can do is we can just show the game quickly, and then Meta team can hand over with the meta presence platform okay because i just want to make sure that we show the game one time to make sure definitely let me uh share my screen real quick uh so i'm gonna share that hopefully everyone can see yeah um information okay so this is the trailer for the game uh we don't have a sound but maybe uh i don't can... have sound okay uh... one second I can maybe. Uh, yeah, might Dokan, need some would you like to support there? Yeah, uh, Dokan, maybe you can already share screen or Does that work? Perfect. 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 Okay. Breaking news: the city is under complete lockdown as a monster attack. Why be a hero when it's much more exciting being Gorilla Zilla? Create chaos in your living room. Defend yourself from attackers and unleash your inner monster. Perfect. Great. At least we have an uh, idea about the game. Now, uh, before actually our team, I would like to give the stage to Meta team, who are actually the creators of this uh, Meta Presence platform features and of course Quest 3. Uh, I would like to um, welcome Winston, first of all, uh, who is working very closely for this project as well. And with his, without his support, we would not achieve that uh, after the Quest 3 launch. Welcome, Winston. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for the intro, Perhan. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I'm here with Laurent uh, and Tim. Uh, maybe we'll just do a quick round of intros and then we'll jump into some uh, some content that we have for you. So uh, Winston, I'm a product manager uh, for Presence Platform. Um, I focus on developer growth and ensuring that we have a lot of great content on Quest that leverages the Presence Platform capabilities. Um, I'll pass over to Laurent. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Laurent, I'm a software engineer at Meta and um, I've been working on tools, developer tools, such as the project setup tool, building blocks. You're going to hear about that in a few minutes. And I hand over to Tim. Hey, I'm Tim. I'm also a software engineer at Meta, I work with Laurent and uh, work on some of the uh, engine uh, SDK um, that we're going to be discussing uh, in a bit. Great. Okay, let me uh, let me pull up some slides. Uh, can everyone see? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Um, so before jumping in, I also just wanted to thank you all for taking the course. Like we're we're very excited that you're very excited to be developing for Quest and to be using Presence Platform capabilities. Um, also, a special thank you to to XR Pro for having us. Um, you know, they're they're truly XR experts. Um, and we're really impressed with the course that they've put together uh, and we're excited to be partnering with them. So um, I just wanted to start by taking a step back uh, and 
looking at one of our core values, which is to build awesome things. Um, this value definitely resonates within reality labs at Meta uh, as we're building the next generation of really exciting um, consumer tech devices, especially in spatial computing. Um, you know, beyond just, you know, Meta, we're seeing that developers are really taking this value to heart and building some really amazing experiences for the devices that are now becoming popularized like Quest 2 and Quest 3. Um, I want to show a quick trailer of one of my favorite experiences on the right, which is an experience called Laser Dance by one of our friends and developers, Thomas Van Bell, uh, who's a developer for Cubism, which is a game many of you may have played. We cannot hear sounds. We cannot hear sound, I guess. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have more videos? <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's fine. Uh, thankfully, okay. the visual in itself is is exciting enough, but yeah. <laughs> the sound adds to it. If if you all want to hear the sound, feel free to to check out the uh, the trailer on YouTube. Um, I that, that video, by the way, leverages a lot of the capabilities that we're going to be going through today, uh, and it's amazing. It's an amazingly fun game um, where you navigate your room, avoiding lasers, uh, and all of the capabilities that make that happen are included within the presence platform. Um, before we get to the platform, I did want to just quickly talk about the launch of Quest Three. Um, it was a really exciting milestone for Meta, uh, but also for the XR industry. Um, Quest Pro was a device that explored what was technologically possible for a device, uh, but not necessarily a mass market device. Uh, but within it, it really showcased the potential for what mixed reality could be like on a headset. Um, with Quest 3, users get the magic of Quest 2 with even more performance, but importantly, a device that is capable of hosting an entirely new class of experiences uh, that leverage an understanding of the world around them to bring certain use cases and experiences to life that should unlock the next level of Quest engagement. Um, there's so much that's possible with Quest 3 that wasn't possible with Quest 2. And given how much there is to be discovered, um, I don't really, I don't think it's ever been a more exciting time to be a developer and to be a Quest developer, uh, which is why this overview of the Quest 3 launch is fitting. You know, it's, it's a more powerful device. It's the most powerful Quest device that we've launched but it's also a completely new environment for developers to, to build experiences and engage users. And excitingly, it's a device that we feel like it, it can scale. Um, and that brings us to Presence Platform. And so the, the, the course that XR Pro has built is oriented around using Meta's Presence Platform capabilities. Uh, Presence Platform is a range of capabilities that enable this next generation of, of experiences on Quest. Uh, the notable capabilities are, are below, but we, we believe it's mixed reality, natural social presence, and intuitive interactions. For mixed reality, uh, it's a combination of things like pass-through and scene and spatial anchors that enables developers to build experiences that blend physical and, and virtual reality, like, like the experience that I showed, uh, Laser Dance. Uh, for natural social presence, uh, we, we have built things like body tracking and face tracking and eye tracking that create more embodied experiences that make social interactions on Quest more realistic. Uh, and, and lastly, for interaction SDK, for intuitive interactions, we leverage hand tracking technology to enable controllerless input and recognize gestures that help people navigate applications. In addition to that, we th have things like haptics technology with a haptics SDK um, that gives people more control of, of how the haptics uh, build off of the experiences that they're building. So. Um, you know, with all of these capabilities, I think it begs the question of what's, what's possible, like what's different, what's new now. Um, and it's been really exciting to see the direction that developers have taken MR and mixed reality versus VR. Uh, we feel that having awareness of the world around you makes new types of games accessible, but beyond that, it can unlock a variety of different use cases. Uh, we've also witnessed a number of different recurring themes that developers are leaning on to help make MR uh, an add-on or an augmentation of VR. Um, and we've compiled a few of these design themes that developers have been using and wanted to share them with you um, because they may, may be themes that you want to incorporate in your experience. And we call these motifs. Um, so just a quick overview of the types of experiences that are beginning to emerge uh, that are using our presence platform capabilities. So 
on the far left, we have things like having fun in MR. So there are standalone MR games. Learning and skill building is a new category. And then solving problems in MR is also a new category. For having fun in MR or, or gaming, we're seeing things like miniaturized games or puzzle games or classic social games um, or card games all be accessible with MR more so than VR. Uh, I think that there's just a benefit to having awareness of the world around you if you're going to be playing a tabletop game like that. For helping someone learn in MR, um, we've seen that blending the real world with the digital world allows developers to build experiences on top of real world objects. This can make something that's a little bit boring or playing like playing the piano much more fun or gamified. And I think one of my favorite MR games uh, that's come out is our app's Piano Vision. Uh, if if you all haven't checked it out, I highly recommend you check it out. It's a lot of fun, and it actually makes piano a lot of fun, um, which is a difficult feat. Um, and then the last category that we're we're beginning to see emerge is sol solving problems, which is obviously a broad category, but it's potentially one of the largest opportunities and relates to how we believe that people can be more productive in MR. Um, Nara is a pretty interesting example of this that we've seen that uses uh, pass through to make the app more compelling and uh, are beginning to incorporate things like co-presence. Um, so these are a few of the different use case categories that we're seeing emerge. Uh, and we feel like there's a lot of untapped potential within each of these as you're building new experiences. As I mentioned earlier, also, we're, we're beginning to see recurring design themes where mixed reality can enhance experiences. Um, and we wanted to share a few of them with you as you're beginning to ideate on concepts that you wanna to build towards after you finish the GorillaZilla course. Um, there's really two buckets here uh, that we've put them within. One is tactics for using MR to augment the world around you. And then the other is providing users with more awareness using MR. So within the first bucket, augmenting the world around you, uh, there's a few that we wanted to share. One is reimagined real world activities, enhancing real world objects, virtual characters in your space, and then building in your space. Um, for reimagined real world activities, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have played Cubism. It's a, it's a game that uh, the developer for Laserdance built, uh, Thomas Van Bell. Um, and originally it was a VR game. But what he did was he realized it's actually potentially a better user experience to be able to play the game and pass through. It's a block building game that defies gravity and having awareness of the world around you just improves the experience. For enhancing real world, world objects, I already mentioned uh, Zara's Piano Vision, which is a great example of this, but there's a number of other ones like Smash Drums where um, it takes a real world activity and with virtual augmentation, it just makes it a more fun experience. Um, with virtual characters in your space, uh, this is a really fun one, especially with the release of our depth API, where as little characters are in your space and they hide behind a real world object that can be included. Um, first encounters, which hopefully all of you have played as you put on your quest threes, uh, really showcases an example of what's possible with virtual characters. And then building in the world around you is also a lot of fun. Um, it, it shows, you know, what's possible when, uh, like, basically you have a digital or a virtual version of Lego building where um, you're not bound by some of the constraints of gravity or real world physics. Uh, Coaster Mania, uh, I'd, I'd reference here if you want to get a feel for what that's like, where you can actually build, a, you know, a roller coaster experience, and then you can transition into the a fully immersive VR mode to ride the roller coaster on what you've built, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, Steve is already here. Maybe he can talk a little bit about that. <laughs> <Hello. laughs> yeah, I'm giving you a shout, Steve. I uh, played it the other night and I love it. Um, so the the second bucket of capabilities we we, want, we wanted to flag, or I'm sorry, of uh, motifs we wanted to flag, um, is how mixed reality can give you a little bit more awareness of the world around you uh, when you're using quests. And as a developer, that unlocks a number of different experiences. Um, for these experiences, we have four different motifs. One is virtual portals in your space, virtual portals to a world beyond. Your room is a VR uh, play space. And then MR is a gateway to VR. Um, for virtual portals in your space, I think this is a common one that we're seeing where there's one virtual portal that allows you to engage with a virtual world while you still are navigating your room or your world. Uh, Zombies Noir is a good example of this one. 
uh, for virtual portals to a world beyond, it leverages that same design theme, but you have several virtual portals and there's this cohesion of what's outside of the portals. And there's a, it, it all basically points you to my real world room is now dropped into this broader virtual world. Um, first encounters is a good example of that one. Uh, as your as the, the mesh breaks and the, your walls are collapsing and you're becoming more and more immersed in that world. Um, there's MR where you can use your room as a VR play space. So you get a little bit of awareness of your surroundings while also being more immersed within a virtual world like House Defender. And then the last one I mentioned is MR as a gateway to VR, uh, which is one of my favorite ones. Um, and we're seeing this more and more and maybe uh, Steve can talk about this because he uses it in Coaster Mania, um, where you know you can build something in MR, but uh, what's really great is building a bridge experience where uh, you're merging what you've built with a fully immersive MR, a VR experience. Um, so you know we've covered eight across these two buckets. I, I did want to say like very early days. You know Quest Three just launched. Presence Platform is beginning to get really great traction, and we're excited to see what you come up with, like what experiences you build that use these but also what, what motifs or what design themes you're able to unlock uh, with some of the cool creative experiences that you built. Um, so that's an overview of you know, Quest 3, Presence Platform, the types of amazing experiences that we think Presence Platform can enable. Um, I now wanted to pass it off to Tim and Laurent who are going to talk about Presence Platform and within each of these buckets, the specific capabilities that, that help you create these experiences. Cool. Thanks, Winston. Uh, can you hear me okay? Cool. Um, so could you go to the next slide? Yeah, so I'm gonna be gonna just giving you a, a high level overview of the specific capabilities um, that enable mixed reality. Uh, next slide, please. So first we're gonna start off with a demo. This is uh, <clears throat> from a demo that we showed at Connect a couple of months ago. It's called Wonder Room. And it's just showing how you can use the um, scene understanding to uh, kind of blend virtual objects with the, the physical environment that kind of turns your living room into a jungle and then this sort of nighttime experience. Uh, all right, next, yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so kind of now going into some of the specific features. Um, so obviously we've got pass through, which is as the name implies, just being able to see the real world um, while you're wearing the a quest. Um, scene understanding gives you an easy way to understand the physical space that the user is in. So you can see the virtual ball is bouncing on the, the appears to bounce on the physical table, the physical floor. And then spatial anchors allow you to build an experience where users can place persistent content. So you can imagine sort of like pinning your Instagram feed to a wall um, in, in a real space. Uh, next, yep, thank you. Um, so we've just released a depth API, or it's, it's a relatively new API. Um, and it does a couple of things. So it enables dynamic occlusions, which you see here in the video. So the virtual character is behind the, appears to be behind the, uh, the physical object is occluded by it. And we also give you uh, access to the, the raw uh, depth uh, textures. So these are real time per eye, per frame, environment depth estimates from the headset's point of view. So you get a texture that uh, for each pixel, it'll tell you, give you a depth estimate. Um, we've also just recently released Mixed Reality Utility Kit, or MRUK. And so this is a sort of higher level functionality, a suite of utilities that help you use um, some of the mixed reality things that I've just talked, uh, spoken about. Um, a lot of it focuses on scene understanding. So there are scene queries that enable you to do things like raycast against the scene, um, find valid spawn positions within a room, uh, checking to see if a particular position is inside of a room and understand those kinds of spatial relationships. There's also things like graphical helpers, which assist in rendering uh, the walls with seamless textures, placing virtual objects, um, as well as a suite of debugging tools. So de uh, tools for that aid in, in development. So things like a scene debugger for visual inspection uh, of your um, scene elements, as well as several um, sort of uh, artificial uh, room environments that you can use for, for testing. Uh, next slide. Yep. Um, another newish uh, feature is uh, building blocks. So this is a tool that helps you get up and running very quickly. It helps configure your Unity scene or your Unreal scene um, 
for uh, to use some of these features. So it's presented as a grid, like you see on the right here, uh, of icons that you can just drag and drop into your project. So it helps you set up things like um, scene understanding, hand tracking, um, interactions, some of the stuff I'll be talking about in the next slides. Uh, but it's a, it's a really great feature for getting up and running really quickly and just uh, drag and drop um, some of those MR features. Um, we're also shipping now the uh, Meta XR simulator. So this is a desktop application that simulates a lot of the OpenXR endpoints. So all of our um, technology goes through OpenXR, which is an open standard. Um, so that, of course, is implemented on uh, the Quest, or the Quest implements these features. But we also have a standalone tool um, that sort of emulates some of those, uh, some of what the, the headset would be doing. So this allows you to develop entirely on a, um, uh, on a desktop without a device connected. Uh, so that can really speed up um, uh, development time. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so some of the things it provides is you've got things like keyboard and mouse interaction. X, uh, you can use an Xbox controller to, to navigate around. We also ship a number of synthetic environments. So you can test your uh, application in a bunch of different virtual uh, um, virtual environments. And it supports things like pass-through, scene, anchors, all the things that uh, I've mentioned so far. Um, so moving on to movement SDK. Movement um, deals with anything that has to do with tracking parts of your body. So things like face tracking, eye tracking, body tracking. Um, and we're very happy to announce inside out body tracking or IOBT. So the problem that this solves is in the past, we were estimating the body pose based on just uh, three points. So it was the, the headset and then your two hands or your two controllers. And then we were trying to kind of figure out where the rest of the body might be. And this led to artifacts like you see here, where if a character leaned over, or sorry, if a, if a user leaned over, it was difficult to distinguish between that case and them taking a step forward. And so with inside out body tracking, we're using the headsets cameras to detect the position of wrists, elbows, shoulders, torso, and that gives us a much more uh, much more accurate uh, tracking system. Um, so we can handle the case where you know the user uh, bends over. It also gives us uh, much more accurate information when, um, like, say, maybe a hand is occluded. So if you're throwing a basketball and one of your hands goes out of view, um, we'll still be able to track uh, the rest of the body. So it gives a, a much more uh, accurate, much more realistic representation. Um, we're also adding legs. Um, so we're calling them generative legs because we're using a machine learning model to and, and generative AI to generate the lower body. So previously we only had uh, kind of from the waist up um, and now we're, we're using a machine learning mod model to generate um, poses for um, animation poses for the legs as well. So it adds a lot of realism. Uh, next, yep. Um, <clears throat> So uh, moving on to interaction SDK. So interaction SDK has to do with interactions between your hands and virtual objects. Um, as I mentioned, we've got building blocks. There's also new building blocks now for interaction SDK, which helps you set up things like grabbable items, throwable items, um, pokeables, pointables, synthetic hands. Um, I'm going to talk about points two and three in later slides. So next one. So hands 2.2. Um, or multimodal. So multi multimodal means simultaneously using hands and controllers. So you can imagine maybe a game as, you know, in my right hand, I've got a controller and that is my magic wand. And in my left hand is just using hand tracking and I'm using that to cast a spell. So you can, you can mix um, both hand tracking and controllers. And also we can seamlessly transition between the two. So you might have an application where you start off, the user starts off holding the controllers and then they set them down and automatically switches to hand tracking. Uh, virtual keyboards. Um, so this is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is a, a high quality keyboard. Um, it includes both indirect and direct touch typing. Um, with uh, uh, swipe typing, type ahead, and dictation. Next one, yeah. And finally, last but not least, we've got the audio SDK. So this supports things like spatial audio, which gives you, um, so rather than just playing a sound, it makes it sound like it's coming from a particular direction and distance. 
uh, as well as room acoustics, which can simulate um, the way that a sound would um, would sound like in a in a particular uh, uh, virtual environment. So that gives you a, a sense, a much more immersive sense of the, the sound is really coming from this virtual environment rather than just you know playing playing an audio clip. Okay, uh, that is all I've got, and I guess from here we'll open it up for questions. Uh, what I suggest is let's take all the questions later. Now people are actually writing on the Q and A tab, but uh, everyone. I see some of you writing on the chat, so please, please write on the Q and A because there are tons of discussions happening <laughs> on the chat. Uh, we will probably miss it, you know. So please share on the Q and A tab, which you can easily uh, highlight your question for us. Okay, so, uh, so thank um, you. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Well, we just wanted to say thank you for being here. We're, we're obviously going to be hopping off shortly. Um, uh, if there are any questions that aren't addressed, uh, like. Farhan knows where to reach us, so we can we can uh, we can follow up. Uh, but it was great to speak with you all. We're excited that you're taking the course um, and appreciate you uh, you building requests. So thanks. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, Steve, maybe you can quickly. For sure. And uh, thank you, Winston, for the uh, the shout out as well. If you haven't left already, appreciate yeah, he's, that. Oh, you got it, Steve. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see so i should be sharing my screen i got a slideshow can everyone see okay yeah great and sharing sound okay so uh wanted to the talk that i'll be going over is about the uh, game design behind gorilla zilla and kind of the steps that we took to create it and how we leverage the presence platform features to be able to create the course that um, is available now. Um, so first, a uh, little bit about me. Uh, so I said, my name is Steven Rogers, creator of GorillaZilla. Um, also founder of a uh, small game studio called Fourth Wall Breakers. Um, and uh, this past March, I was uh, had the honor to participate in the uh, Meta's Presence Platform Hackathon in Menlo Park and ended up uh, being the winner of that and also a avid roller coaster enthusiast, as you all have seen with uh, Coaster Mania. Um, yeah, so uh, these are some of the games that I've worked on. So uh, this is a small video of the uh, hackathon uh, submission that we had. Uh, it's called uh, Submersed, in which uh, your room starts flooding in. Uh, holes are starting to appear, and you got to plug them up with uh, Band-Aids, trying to not drown. Also uh, worked on Brushwork Studio, which is a VR painting game. Um, and if you look on the Meta browser, it's actually featured as one of the uh, uh, games that you can play on the browser uh, in, in the homepage there. And as well, a mixed reality game called Pillow, in which you're laying down and uh, relaxing and a bunch of different uh, smaller experiences tied to that. Um, more recently, I've been uh, working on Coaster Mania, uh, which is a game where you design roller coasters inside your room, then you get to ride them, as Winston said, in VR, solve puzzles and a bunch of different other interactions, which has been a ton of fun. And if you want to check it out, it's available on App Lab currently. Um, yeah, and then more recently, GorillaZilla. So I think Breaking we already news. saw the, the trailer. I can go ahead and lockdown. skip this for now. Uh, but uh, First, I wanted to talk about why we chose GorillaZilla in the first place. Um, so when we were reached out about creating the course, uh, we were told that first, we want to be able to prioritize the presence platform and to be able to highlight all the capabilities that are there. So we need to be able to take advantage of um, you know, all the different capabilities, such as hand tracking, um, their interaction SDK, which we'll get into a little bit, um, scene understanding, so that's being able to capture your room and understand where a table is, where furniture is inside your space. It also had to be um, easy to learn how to build. Um, so we actually ended up rebuilding the app a couple of times to be able to make sure that all the code was legible, all comments were uh, available and uh, ready and accessible for anyone to drop in and to be able to take the course and uh, create with it. 
Um, and then lastly, it had to be fun and intuitive to play. Um, I don't know if anyone here in the chat has gotten a chance to try it out yet, um, but I definitely recommend it. It's a lot of fun at parties, uh, seeing, especially I've seen my spouse uh, playing around, smacking stuff around and yelling. It, it's a ton of fun to watch. Um, great. So that that's why we chose GorillaZilla. Um, first, I wanted to show a little prototype of uh, when we first got started. Uh, we wanted to first see if it was fun to even just destroy buildings in, in your room with your hands, uh, which was pretty good. But there are definitely some challenges and uh, uh, shortcomings that uh, we ended up having to solve later. Um, so one of those things was, A, the game wasn't really challenging, uh, at least in the little prototype. All you're doing is just destroying buildings, so there wasn't much of an objective there, so we had to add that. You'll also notice uh, the building spawned in a grid, and that kind of felt a little out of place inside your room. Naturally, a city sprawls throughout your, your space, so we had to figure out a solution for that. You'll also notice buildings can spawn inside of furniture, and um, Obviously, that doesn't necessarily feel great, so we had to figure out a solution for that. And also, it needed to have a little bit more interaction. Um, one of the things we we saw quickly was that uh, you could easily destroy all the buildings by just running around the room and being as quick as possible, which obviously, like, that can be fun, but that can also be a hazard as well if you can't see all of your rooms. So we had to figure out solutions to fix that. Um, so uh, for the challenge side, we added enemies uh, that attack you, shooting bullets at you. So you'll notice we have a little helicopter and turrets that spawn inside the buildings. Um, and that instantly added a lot of fun. Um, but we also uh, took inspiration from a game called Super Hot VR, um, which is a great game. Encourage a lot of people to play it. Um, but in it, uh, time moves when you move, and uh, that instantly felt really good for GorillaZilla to be able to make all of your movements inside of the game have reason, and, it, and henceforth, it slowed down the game pace and made sure that like you're not running through everything um, and uh, potentially crashing into your furniture. Um, then uh, we had to figure out how to actually utilize uh, the scene understanding and where to spawn these buildings inside your space. Um, so we leveraged uh, scene understanding, the scene API that's available in the presence platform. And we had to figure out a good solution for being able to figure out where is a good spot to, to place these buildings. So you'll notice in this picture over to the side, um, we, we spawn a grid inside your room and then we first search, is it colliding with any spot in the uh, furniture? And if it is, then we say, hey, this isn't a good spot. Um, and then we move on. Um, then after that, we utilize the size of the room to scale how many buildings should spawn, how many entities, so that it's a fair experience, regardless if you're playing in a large space or a small space, it um, should all work the same um, and be just as fun. Um, we also wanted to encourage full room movement. So when we spawn buildings, we're not just picking random spots inside the, the block. We're calculating distances between buildings so that people actually have to run around the room and uh, get from one corner to the next. And then as well, we vary it up. So you'll notice in the early prototype, it was just one building. Now we have different kinds of buildings. We have a donut shop and a large, tall building, wide building, um, different stuff that makes it feel more live. Um, and a lot of these new tools, uh, as I believe Tim was uh, suggesting earlier, uh, the Mixed Reality Utility Kit makes a lot easier for uh, being able to spawn stuff smartly inside your room. Um, and I believe we'll be pushing out an update for uh, Realizilla to utilize that in the future, too. Um, then we also uh, use the Mesh API. So one of the shortcomings of scene understanding, for those of you that have uh, worked with it before is that it can be tedious to draw out uh, boxes inside your space. And uh, with the Quest 3, with the new depth sensor, um, you can calculate a mesh of your room um, as seen by this picture. And with this, you can actually figure out a lot of stuff and it's a lot easier to set up. 
Um, it's also very powerful for um, adding occlusions, though there are some shortcomings with adding using the mesh for occlusions, such as if you've scanned the room once um, and then something moves, then it's not always going to be able to pick it up. So there might be something that uh, gets in the way uh, and, and looks a little out of place. Um, but uh, it's still definitely a powerful tool. Um, it's also more precise for uh, collisions and figuring out where furniture is inside of the room instead of just a box. We now have the actual shape. Um, and also it adds a lot of immersion for collisions and objects. So whenever you destroy a building, uh, the rubble can fall off onto the, the couch and roll down the, the side, which is great. Um, then uh, we also ended up utilizing the Interaction SDK, which uh, is a set of tools for being able to create hand tracking and controller based uh, interactions, um, such as like grabbing, poking, uh, throwing stuff, and a whole suite of different tools there. Um, so first, uh, we wanted to know why why use hand tracking to begin with. Um, you know, I think most games that are available on the store now utilize controllers, um, and I think more recently we're we're starting to see a trend of, of hand tracking, but uh, it, it's uh, there are definitely some shortcomings, but also highlights of hand tracking. So one of those things is that it's definitely a lot more intuitive. Everybody has hands. Everybody knows how to use their hands. Um, whereas if you put a controller into somebody that's never touched a controller before, it can definitely be a little daunting. Um, also, for our case, hand tracking adds a lot of immersion. We end up skinning the the hand uh, that you have to turn them into these monster claws, which feels great. Um, and also, it forces some simplicity in the design whenever you start with a hand tracking game first. Um, as you don't have those buttons on the controller, you have to figure out ways to be able to create that that are just as intuitive as being able to just tap something with your hands. Um, as I said, the interaction SDK makes it super easy to use. Tim mentioned the uh, uh, building blocks, which is super easy to just implement. Uh, just click and drag and drop different features from grabbing, poking, uh, pretty much anything else. You can uh, also, for our case, it was pretty easy to set up hand rigging for being able to convert your hand into these uh, monster claws, and then plenty of examples there too. Um, then in terms of interactions, obviously we still had the, the smacking of the, the hands, but we also wanted to utilize your voice as much as possible. I feel like that is a, a good way to embody the, the monster that you're becoming. Um, so we ended up using, uh, creating this uh, mechanic called the roar um, in which players grab a donut. And then as soon as they eat it, it activates this, uh, Power where you can use your voice to shout out beams of sound to destroy the buildings, um, which, as I said, my wife, it, it's <laughs> a lot of fun to see from, from an outside perspective. Um, uh, but there are definitely some challenges with using the voice SDK, such as like figuring out how to trigger when the mic should listen. Uh, one of the things with the voice SDK is that you can't constantly be using the mic to listen into the user, you have to have a trigger to be able to listen in. Um, and that's just for privacy concern, making sure that it's not always listening to you. So you have to figure out a clever uh, way to be able to trigger that event. For us, it's eating the donut. I've seen examples where people can pick up a telephone and put it to the ear and that um, intuitively you're gonna wanna talk into it. A um, couple of other ones you could look up at the ceiling and kind of talk to God or <laughs> what else have you. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, it, it has to, you have to figure out a good solution there. Um, but it adds a lot of uh, added benefit uh, to it as well. Um, you'll also notice we have a bunch of different visual feedback whenever we're listening. So that's changing the pass through to green and um, having the roar prompt. Um, but the voice SDK isn't just uh, being able to detect, detect mic input. It can detect words that you say and has a large language model that yeah, it can process uh, everything uh, from, say, turn on the light switch to 
change this block to the color orange or something, and it it is powerful enough to do that, but also has uh, special features such as uh, text to speech, which is uh, a really great feature, especially for tutorialization. A lot of people don't really want to read uh, whenever you're you're presenting stuff in front of them, so having uh, some voice interaction is definitely a, a good boost. Um, yeah, so uh, key takeaways from building the the game. Uh, I, I definitely encourage everyone to play into the silliness of uh, mixed reality and VR. You know, uh, putting on a headset, you're already going to look silly, uh, at least till uh, we have uh, some similar looking devices. Um, so might as well play into it. Uh, also, I encourage everyone to prototype and iterate, iterate often. Um, often, first thing that you work on isn't going to be the first solution that you end up going with. Uh, constantly uh, look for ways to improve. Um, also, for mixed reality, uh, you want to realize why you're actually util using pass-through and why you can actually see your room. And if you can utilize a the space in a clever way that actually makes you feel that like why this game needs to be in pass through then uh, use it as much as possible um as well uh movement as a mechanic so obviously you can move around the room you there it's can be a ton of fun but also some safety challenges so uh, always be considering the safety of your user make sure that they aren't uh running into stuff um always uh, emphasize intuitive controls. And uh, lastly, the present platform is a great tool set and encourage everyone to use it. Yeah, and uh, lastly, uh, if anyone has any questions or answers, I don't know, Fairhan, do we wanna uh, yeah. do this uh, later? Sure. Yeah, Sean will give maybe a few minutes of uh, overview of the course, and we will immediately hop into the Q&A because we have already over 30 questions waiting for oh, us. Wow. Great. <laughs> so, awesome. Sean, Sean, maybe you can uh, maybe you can continue sharing the screen, uh, Steve, so we don't waste time. Definitely. Uh, and uh, for anyone that wants to reach out, my email's down there. Um, all okay. right. Thank you very much, Steve, for this absolutely very interesting game uh, that we uh, we we were really enjoying a lot, especially kids, as you mentioned. Hello, Sean. So, yeah. would you like to quickly? share about uh, what kind of learning experience waiting for us uh, for yeah, those who would yeah. like to join. Absolutely. I'm only going to be about three or four minutes, uh, maybe five at the most, uh, just to leave some time for Q&A at the end uh, while we have everyone on the call. Uh, so yeah, Steve, if you just want to go to the next slide, uh, just a, a really brief 30 second intro to myself. Uh, my name is Sean Ong. I've got a uh, studio, uh, Seattle-based studio. It's actually called XR Dev Studio. We do a ton of mixed reality apps, uh, everything from games to enterprise, uh, and uh, I've also published a couple books on mixed reality development, taught um, endless courses and video courses on mixed reality development, I'm really passionate about uh, showing and teaching uh, mixed reality concepts. Uh, a lot of those have been uh, with XR Bootcamp. That's great. And of course, the most recent one that we've been talking about is the uh, course on Udemy uh, to learn how to make uh, GorillaZilla that Steve just showed. So if you haven't already, uh, please do sign up for that. Uh, and uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of my face on there. Uh, I also have uh, multiple uh, AR VR uh, successful startups that I've founded. Uh, including uh, primarily uh, co-located uh, multiplayer experiences. One of them is called Limitless VR, where people are running around uh, physical obstacles. Everything's kind of snapped in, perfectly aligned, perfectly anchored. And uh, that's, uh, I think we've got several dozen uh, locations now. And yeah, expanding very fast uh, throughout the country, throughout the world. So keep an eye for a location near you. <laughs> All right, so uh, really quick, diving into uh, the game. So why did we choose Gorilla Zilla? Uh, it was uh, because we wanted to choose uh, something that really captured as many presence platform features as possible. Uh, and we wanted to do something that was fairly uh, easy to and quick to pick up. So we wanted pass through, we wanted scene understanding, we wanted hand tracking. 
uh, we wanted the voice SDK and we wanted to kind of cram as much uh, kind of meat as we can into a tutorial to show you kind of a holistic uh, application for what it looks like to integrate all of these different pieces, build it to the Quest 3 and not something that's going to take two weeks to learn, but we wanted it to be something that you could actually just do in a few hours. And so that's what we achieved with uh, the GorillaZilla Udemy course. It's actually challenge. It's easy to do a long course, right? It's easy to do a hundred day course and break everything down, but to try and squeeze everything in uh, as efficiently and, and as quickly as possible, it's a little bit uh, challenging, but we, we achieved it. So it's uh, great. If you see over here on the slide, there's uh, split out, the lesson is split out into seven different modules. Uh, each modules have se several lectures and they're intended to be bite-sized pieces. So you, you don't have to invest like, okay, I'm going to sit down for three hours or two hours and take this class. You can take, you know, a few minutes here and there. So it's really designed to, uh, uh, you know, be in line with the modern way of people uh, that people consume content, you know, bite-sized pieces, one minute videos, three minute videos, maybe at the, at the longer end, it might be a, you know, seven to nine minute video, but most of these videos, in each of these modules are fairly bite-sized. Uh, they're very interactive. Uh, they're very exciting. Uh, we do mix a good combination of uh, theory and concepts with actual hands-on. So as you're building things, as you're kind of dragging and dropping and opening Unity and doing things, you're also hearing uh, some concepts about why you're doing what you're doing, what it all means, uh, how it fits in in the broader context of mixed reality and uh, the future of, of uh, you know, VR and MR development. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's something that uh, we tried to to look for uh, balance. So uh, just really quick, yeah, you just uh, uh, go from the very beginning, which is actually built upon Meta's latest thing that was just released not long ago, Building Blocks. Uh, building Blocks makes it way, way easier uh, to develop, uh, literally just you know, click a button for what you want and it adds it to your scene and behind the scenes, there's a whole bunch of uh, configurations taking place. So you don't have to, you know, gone are the days where you had to, you know, go through like a needle in the haystack and set all the different settings. And if it doesn't work, you have to figure out which one of the thousand settings you got wrong. <laughs> uh, so building blocks is great. So it's really kind of built every new feature that we teach is uh, built upon some of these uh, building blocks. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so we talk about you know, pass through and hand tracking, you know, pass through being kind of the key cornerstone of mixed reality, uh, how to properly set that up, best practices for hand tracking, uh, and uh, not only how you can do just native hand tracking, but how you can even reskin your hands like Steve showed uh, the, the monster hands. So we kind of go through a little bit of that and show you kind of how you can add physics. We also, um, although it's uh, not a big part of GorillaZilla. We also show some other things like how you can grab things with your hands, how you can throw things with your hands, how you can interact with menus. So we kind of cover all of that uh, in the course. If we go to the next slide, scene understanding. Steve, you talked about this quite a bit. Uh, so we're actually uh, in the middle right now of uh, updating the scene understanding to use the mixed reality utility kit, which is extremely powerful. Uh, but even the course as is gives you a really good idea of how to get scene understanding into your application, what it is, kind of it kind of teaches you about the concepts of what you can do with it, what are all the possibilities, and uh, just kind of frames your thinking in certain ways where you can understand like how best to leverage uh, scene understanding in your own application. All right. Perfect. Great. Yeah, so I think that that pretty much covers the basics. And if you have more questions uh, for me or for the course, we have after the Q&A session, we have a whole kind of dedicated hour, I believe, just to talk about uh, the course. So we can, uh, yeah, we can talk about that soon as well. Back to you, Farhan. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, we can maybe show our spaces. Perfect. So um, we have uh, first focus on Meta Presence Platform since Meta team uh, is here. For a couple of more minutes uh, we have quite a bunch of questions so feel free to team uh, learn feel free to uh, take over uh, whatever question that you feel comfortable to answer so shall i quickly start is it okay so we can at least cover as many questions as possible feel free uh, to dj 
Exactly. I will DJ quickly. So Richard asks, great to release Depth API as I worked with Google on some uh, projects for Android devices. The problem was the distance depending on device around five meters. I guess the scanning is much better now for those features on Quest 3. And are, are there still limitations we need to know about when implementing? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the specifics uh, of the number, uh, like in terms of five meters or so, but it's it's based on kind of a similar, you know, it's like LiDAR type of sensor. Um, so I would imagine it has a, a similar restriction where it's not going to just work uh, infinitely. Um, and I guess like kind of as you saw in the, in the uh, slide earlier, you know, uh, right around the edges, the occlusion gets a little, like we have to do some kind of uh, estimates and some smoothing there. So it gets a little bit, um, uh, fuzzy, I guess, around around the edges of optics. Perfect. Next question, Jose asked, can you talk about OpenXR feature parity with the Meta SDK? I guess Meta Presence platform generally. Right. So all of our APIs are OpenXR based. So OpenXR is an open standard, um, and uh, I can link you to the uh, the Chronos site for that. Um, in terms of Feature parity, I guess there's so OpenXR kind of breaks down into a couple of different categories. You kind of have the 1.0 spec, which everybody implements, and then there are vendor specific extensions. So a lot of our presence platform um, features go through uh, meta specific extensions. So it does go through OpenXR, but it is like there's no, there's not really like a singular scene understanding that everybody um, who implements OpenXR uses. So it is kind of still specific to, to Meta's implementation at the moment. Perfect. Uh, one question actually related with the previous one. Can you use the Presence platform or Quest 3 outdoors or do you have any plan? That's, um, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. I've seen, um, I, I guess, kind of the primary uh, use case that we imagine at the moment is more indoors, focused on indoors. Um, I have seen YouTube videos of people who like, I think there was a guy who went driving with it? I wouldn't recommend that. But <laughs> I have people have tried to use it outside, and and they have some success with it. Um, but yeah, yeah I guess, get in trouble. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, don't don't do that. Don't drive with it. Um, I'd be interested in, in understanding the uh, the use case there. If um, if that person has more details they want to share, what they're trying to do. Perfect. So let's continue with another question. Um, how about the web uh, support? WebXR support. Um, there is some WebXR support. Laurent, do you know? Do you have more details on that? Um, there is WebXR support, but uh, I'm, I, I don't know what's the latest exciting news and features on, on this one. Uh, I, I would... recommend. Uh, I recommend to check the the web uh, session from Connect Twenty Three yeah. uh, on Meta uh, YouTube channel. I think it would be the best. Yeah, that's a good idea. Also, if you go to developer.oculus.com, a lot of these, um, yeah. yeah, that should should help. One question. I have been using XR Toolkit for the past few months before hearing about Meta Presence recently. I did not choose it uh, so that I could enjoy the open XR part. In fact, I have only been developing for Quest. So here's the problem. My heart is still heavy to shift to Meta Presence platform as I have to observe uh, it works different, but looks much simpler and interesting. What do you think? What is your honest opinion between Meta Presence platform versus XR? I think toolkit it says, but XR interaction toolkit probably it means um, the Unity. Switch to Meta Presence platform. Just kidding, you can feel the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> What is your opinion about? I mean, uh, I can also we can our team also can have some kind of uh, more opinions after you leave. <laughs> we can also, but uh, yeah, please feel free to feel free to share. Uh, I mean, my honest answer is like I don't, I have not done a, a deep comparison between Unity's XRI and our own ISDK, um, so it'd be hard for me to render an opinion. Uh, they they both serve similar purposes. Um, and I think maybe the the answer kind of comes down to if you're trying to, what is important to a lot of our um, developers is that they're trying to target multiple devices or multiple um, multiple types of headsets. And so Unity is probably going to be a better uh, answer for going cross-platform. Um, but that is also something that we're we're trying to do as well. Like we, re we recognize that need and um, 
we want to also offer interaction SDK for other uh, platforms, not just Meta. Um, yeah. So probably comes down to the need there. Yeah. And I so, can, uh, I can, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, uh, you can actually use both also depending on your use case. So one application that we recently made used both the presence platform and XRI uh, together uh, and uh, worked pretty well. You know, if you want certain things uh, specific to the quest, like uh, anchors, uh, you'll definitely want the presence platform, uh, anchors and certain parts of uh, pass through, things like that. But uh, what we ended up doing was we used uh presence platform for those quest specific features and then xri for other things like um, hand interactions and that allowed us to target other devices as well so we were able to build to let's say the htc by focus 3 of course you don't get the anchors and things like that on the focus 3 but the hand tracking and all that still works so you can actually use both of them uh, in you know combined with each other too if you wanted to um one last thing I, I'd like to add. Uh, I think there is an argument to make to make when when you want to mix uh, presence platform features. Uh, there are instances where you would want your interaction to to work well with path through, to work well with scene awareness, and and we we as we continue to grow presence platform and as we continue to develop, like for instance, building blocks um they are meant to work together and so there is an added value to go that path wonderful so we have a couple of more questions could we have some more information and tutorials on the multi-model functionality for controllers plus hand i went through the mr course uh, um, and it's not covered yet because it's a very new thing so we are adding up on this course, but anything that you would uh, suggest right now is in terms of documentation uh, till we add the module about hands plus controllers. Yeah, I was going to try to dig up the documentation and, and post. Uh, I saw that question in the uh, q and I'll, I'll uh, try to find a link for you. Yeah, it will be very interesting for most of the people. Um, can I use multimodal hands also with my shoes to detect my feet with the controller strapped to my shoes? I saw that. I actually don't know. Um, I think probably not. So like you can switch between them and you can use a controller in one hand and and just hand in the other, but both tracking both the hands and the controllers at the same time and using all, so you'd have four different inputs. I don't think that's the intention of that, um, of multimodal. I think you would at least need the uh, pro controllers for that too. Exactly. Uh, we had we have been in the Meta Hackathon recently. We uh, connect the Quest Pro controller to a vacuum cleaner to create some kind of like a interesting vacuum gamified vacuuming game. So yeah, I think I suggest I, I agree with uh, Steve's suggestions. I think it's a very nice uh, like Quest Pro is also perfect for that. Um, Using one hand controller and one hand tracking, how do you prevent the quest from attempting to switch to both hand tracking or both controllers, like one controller not detected, since it typically switches between one or the other? Um, I don't know that's the specifics of that, Laurent or Winston, maybe. No, but, um... uh, I, I think that's the point of uh, multimodal. Um... That that's the problem that is actually solving, but I'm not familiar with the tech itself, so I'm not going to be able to confirm it. Um, maybe we can also dig up this. Uh, by the way, we have an XR Creators Discord server, which includes GorillaZilla Udemy course focused channels. So if, please, if you have any further questions, feel free to ask there. If we cannot answer, we are asking the Meta team. So your you don't have any questions left unanswered okay so feel free to ask these questions on the um, server as well um, there are some course related questions which we will answer don't worry about that um, uh, 
okay, um, there is a some kind of like a text mesh pro related feedback that you can maybe uh, check. I will share with you meta team. Uh, one important question, but I don't know if you can answer uh, before that, Jared, uh, I would like to also introduce Jared, who is the one of the masterminds behind the course and the, uh, all the um, strategy of all our courses. So hello, Jared, would you like to add something? Yeah, well, there's a question on the chat that um, about time interaction, and I want to, you know, I want to ask that and then kind of like just a general question, maybe to Laurent here. Um, we have the meta interaction SDK and then you have XRI that are kind of like, you know, you get this cool feature over here and then it's copied over here and they're kind of like both learning from each other. Um, so I would love the, the answer of like, are you guys planning a climb interaction? And then is there ever any plans for a bridge, right? Where I could build with the Oculus SDK, but I could still use the interactors from XRI. Is that planned at all? Uh, that that's a very good uh, question. That's that's a topic that is often discussed um, for the reason you you gave. Um, I, I cannot share the, any specifics, but um, interaction is uh, like you mentioned a bridge, and like this is a, a core effort of interaction. That's, this is an act acknowledged need, and. Um, well, one thing that that we can see from interaction is that that abstraction of of like what's be what's below what's the what's under the hood and and that would like i i would argue that the current philosophy is that if you need a bridge you could make it uh, and obviously, we like we we could we could also like like propose it, but like at the moment, it should be theoretically possible to write the bridge if you really need one. And then specifically about the climb interaction, is that anything you guys are looking at? Um, I'm I'm not uh, not not being in the interaction team. I don't have any specific on that one interaction. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Jared. Uh, one, I think we have already covered most of the stuff about Presence Platform. Maybe one, two questions left. Will the Meta XR tokens continue to work with the free version of Unity? I don't know if you would like to answer that now because it's a little bit future questions. Uh, this anonymous attendee says that I heard that Apple Vision Pro requires Unity Pro and will not work with the free Unity. So uh, I don't know if uh, maybe you can tell the current situation at least. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that to some extent. Um, yeah, we don't have any plans to monetize our, our plugins for Unity or Unreal, so they will remain free. Another reason to start working on Quest 3. Uh, great. So, I mean, uh, there's one more question. How much is the body estimation accurate when your body example legs is outside of the field of view of the headset? Sorry, uh, could you repeat the question? My internet's a bit unstable. I think. Uh, how accurate uh, is the body tracking if it the 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 uh, uh, the tracking is outside of the field of the head field of the view of the headset? How accurate it is? I see. So, um, was there a question? Was it specific to legs or just? Just example legs, example legs, but it can be anything. We are just asking if yeah. I'm outside of field field of view. How the tracking works. So the more <laughs> that's a hard question to answer precisely because it's it's blending, it's using a lot of sensor data and blending that with a machine learning model. So um, obviously the more that it can see, the better the better it is. It doesn't track your legs using the sensors. That's all uh, generative AI based on the the upper body that it can see. Um, uh, so. It's just that it's better from the previous model where we only had really three three points like your head and your and two hands. Now it can actually it's actually trying to track parts of your arm. So if your hand goes out of the field of view, but it can still see other parts of your arm, then we can still kind of um, infer the the location of those other things. But if like you put your both hands behind your back, it's it's gonna be difficult. Okay, last question I actually combined. Uh, 
uh, what about spatial recording will that be possible in the future and there was also another question will quest 3 record 3d video any spatial recording what is what is that like as far as i understand you can record your spatial environment data i guess uh, not like a 2d image but like a with depth like almost like mm. nerf or type of thing as far as i understand of course I assumption see. Yeah, so the, the way that the data is organized now is it's you have a collection of um, scene anchors. So like you'll have like each wall is represented as an anchor with some data attached to it, like the, the boundary or the width and the height. Um, so you'll be able to, so any app can access that information that is set up by the user when they go to, uh, when they set up their space from the, the settings menu. So apps have access to that. Um, if uh, there's also then a, a mesh uh, available on Quest 3. Um, so the apps have access to that. I think, are you, are you asking like if it'll be sort of like how persistent it'll be or or the ability to... Um... Yeah, it's a, like a capability as far as I understand. But there were yeah. already some uh, links being shared, so that's great. So um, okay. I don't want to take so much of your time. We will continue the questions, especially the much more course related stuff. But uh, I would like to also hand over to maybe Winston or any of you who would like to, because we have some poll results. Uh, I think based on that, we have a much better understanding uh, what kind of audience uh, that we are uh, now uh, having today, quite a crowded one. So Winston, what is your maybe advice to people who would like to build the next uh, App Lab or Metastore game or app? So what is the best thing uh, we can do. Sure. So first of all, I appreciate you all taking a poll. Um, uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, maybe I'll just do a quick overview of the results because I think it's interesting for all of us. Um, so we asked four questions. First one being, you know, what type of XR development does everyone here have? Um, and it looks like uh, a huge, there's about 60, uh, uh, 175 who are entirely new. So about a third um, who maybe haven't been XR developers, but are just beginning to learn through the course, um, which, which is exciting. Uh, a, a huge portion who have been at it for a while, but never published an App Lab or published an App Lab request store. So about 90 of 180, so about half. Um, and then there's a portion, so the remaining 20% who are XR developers, but new to Meta. Um, I think this is exciting to us because it's people who are coming, a, a big portion of the people who are developing now are coming with a, a blank slate and are fresh and may come up with like concepts that could work perfectly for MR and may not be tied to what they've previously built in VR, which is really cool. Um, the next question was on, um, have you heard of Presence Platform, which is a bit more straightforward. I was sad to see that about half said no. Um, so I think that's good feedback for us. Um, I think uh, we'd love to raise awareness of this. I think it's things like this, events like this, and events or investments like the course and partnerships like the course that will help create more awareness. Um, and then, you know, about 25, so about 14% said that they have used the capabilities, which is exciting. Um, what types of applications is everyone excited to build? Um, it, it's, it was great to see everyone, uh, it, it is pretty even distribution here. So some people excited about exploring new problems that are only solvable by XR, um, education apps, apps that help people learn, apps that help people work more efficiently. And then I guess we didn't do a good job with a poll because a portion of people said new categories, we didn't even list it. So uh, it would be great to just see in the thread if people want to post uh, in the chat, uh, what type of concepts they're most excited about. Would love to just see what uh, what what types of ideas people have here. Um, or if you're interested in just building games and it's, it's games that you're interested in, uh, let us know also. Um, regarding the biggest pain points, this was definitely my my favorite question because um, more than half of everyone thinks that now is the time to start building for Quest. Um, obviously, lots changed over the course of the past three years. Uh, the XR space is changing. So I'm glad that we are striking while the iron is hot and, and doing all these things at the right moment. So um, appreciate all the feedback. Um, I just wanted to flag also, we will be at MIT Reality Hack. Um, I've seen a number of comments on the thread that, that people will be joining there. Uh, look out for us. Come say hi. We'd love to meet you. Um, finish the course before you do. Um, I think if you finish the course, it'll, it'll, uh, increase your prospects of success in the reality hack. Um, and, uh, appreciate you all building requests. Um, and yeah, maybe, Winston, 
uh, Winston, you can also tell a little bit about if I built a unique app on App Lab, anything waiting for me as a developer or studio that might be a chance for me to get more support from Meta? Also want to add to that question, it seems some people in the chat are unaware of what App Lab is, so maybe also a brief yeah, on, on App Lab. Exactly. Sure. Um, so App Lab is a way where you can uh, publish an application that you can uh, get people to use from Quest without them having to sideload. Um, so if you build a really cool concept and you want to begin to get feedback on you know, um, you know, is it interesting to people? Is it a fun experience in Quest? Uh, how does it resonate? Then you would upload the app to App Lab. Um, once the app is in App Lab, you're gonna begin to get feedback uh, on the experience and on the performance. Um, and you can continue to tweak the app as you begin to build on it with the you know, hopes of eventually publishing it to Quest Store. Um, so App Lab is really the main mechanism that people publish applications today. Um, and I think what, what Fairhan is mentioning is, you know, we, we are going to be exploring ways where we can support more developers, um, uh, you know, as, as they're building concepts. I think Start is probably the best example of that. We do have an, or, uh, a community of developers, newer developers, and uh, it's called the Start Program. It's available on our Quest website, on our developer website. Um, it is um, recommended that you've published an app to App Lab beforehand because it's not entirely new developers, but it's developers with a little bit of experience who want to be in more of a community. There's a Discord channel where they can ask questions. Um, there's a few, you know, incentives around, you know, being able to get support from meta engineers as they run into roadblocks or, you know, basically keep pulse on updates, collaborate with one another, and they also uh, get information regarding hackathons that we coordinate. So. You know, in uh, December, we you may have seen from our developer uh, a, a Twitter account for, for Quest, you know, we hosted a hackathon for Start Developers. And uh, we came as Meta, we, Laurent and uh, Tim were actually both there. I was there myself. Um, Farhan was actually there also and was on one of the winning teams. It seems you're everywhere, Farhan. Um, I... Uh, you know, it, it, it was great because a hundred people came, uh, got to bring teams of people they're already building applications with and got to come up with concepts. And there's a number of those applications that we're, we're going to be working with those teams and uh, giving them some funds to continue to build out those concepts. So I think joining Start is your first step in the direction of beginning to uh, be in touch with Meta and uh, get support as you continue your, your developer journey. And then hopefully we have more updates uh, on new programs that support you over the course of the coming year. Perfect. I shared the link of the start. So thank you, Winston and all the Meta team for joining us. We are continuing. Uh, we will answer the rest of the questions and then we will, it will follow up uh, with the office hour for those who are already going through Udemy. Thanks for initiating this whole actually XR uh, industry. It's not only about Quest 3 here. I think many studios are really uh, appreciating that Meta is taking quite a bit of uh, investment and risk for the sake of the future of XR. Uh, there are many, I would say, game and uh, apps uh, studios that are very thankful uh, that uh, Meta is doing that. So I think we what we see is if we can really make sure that these devices become successful, for the adoption. I think it will really help all the creators and developers here. Thanks again for joining us and spending time with us today. I hope that we will see each other in the next project or games or courses or even success stories that we can share together. Looking forward to it. Thank you all for joining. Thank, thank, you, thank you to the XR thank Pro you, team. Laren. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank okay. you. So let's continue with the rest of the questions. I know that there are a few more questions. Uh, that we have left, so our expert team here uh, that we can continue. So when can we expect an Oculus app for Mac, which supports Quest Link for quick application testing without going through the route of installing Windows uh, VM? I don't know if anyone has worked on um, uh, this, Sean or Jared. Yeah, I, that's a question that we really should have posted to the, the meta team themselves, right? It requires the requires the Oculus app on Quest and it requires all of the sensor streaming in order to support play mode in Unity. And uh, unfortunately, that's not something that Meta has today. I don't know what the roadmap is for that. I think still, uh, maybe we can tell about the friction. If you have a Mac 
uh, machine. What is the friction there? Maybe Sean, you can share from our previous education experience yeah yeah so for those uh, in the audience who uh, uh, need a little bit more context so on a Windows device uh, you are able to stream from unity to your headset uh, using something called quest link uh, to make development a lot faster so you, you don't have to build to your headset every time if you're developing on a Mac uh, you have to actually compile your application every time you want to test it on your headset and so that adds uh, a lot more development time uh, and it adds a lot more inefficiencies. Uh, Meta has been coming out with things that are in the right direction. So there is something called the, I think it's the XR simulator. Is that right? Yeah, they uh, yeah. And so uh, still early days on that, you know, it, it came out just recently. So there's still some improvements that are being made there, but uh, it's moving in the right direction where you're able to test uh, things within your editor. It doesn't stream it to your headset yet, but you're able to use your keyboard and mouse to walk around, to do hand tracking, to do spatial mapping, scene understanding, uh, things like that. Uh, so that's using the XR simulator. Uh, like uh, Jared mentioned, there's nothing on the roadmap that I'm aware of for native Mac support. Uh, 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 my, my gut is that we won't see that for quite some time because it's really hard to do. It's not something that's easy to do. That's more on a hardware level uh, than a software thing. And so I wouldn't be holding my breath, uh, but you can use things like the XR simulator uh, in order to kind of bridge the gap in the meantime. Yeah, can I, can I add to that real quick? The, there's actually two simulators, one from Unity if you're doing XRI development, and then the other from Meta themselves. And uh, Meta just released a new library called the XR Utility Kit. And that has some additional simulation capabilities. So for example, we were talking earlier about the scene understanding. Um, it will be possible to load a room model into the simulator as well. So again, not the nice capability Sean was just talking about being able to play and actually run on the headset in your environment, but they are improving the simulator capabilities um, that will help close some of those gaps. Yep. I'll, I'll add one more thing that if you are a, a, an avid developer, if you're creating an application and spending hours and hours a day, you know, in Unity developing for your VR experience and you, you are a Mac user, it's probably worth it to get a PC just for that iteration. I know that when uh, Quest Link broke on one of my PCs uh, and I had to factory reset the PC to get it working again and I didn't want to do that, I ended up getting another PC just for being able to iterate faster uh, using Quest Link, using the streaming, because it, it does save a lot of time. It, I, I don't have a hard number, but if I could guess, I would say it saves a, it shaves off about 30% off of your development time to have that. Wonderful. Um, quickly, I, let's answer because we have a couple of more questions before we finish. Um, are, I mean, do you see an adoption of Unity over its competitors like Unreal for enterprise productivity applications? I mean, I can answer quickly, like you don't, uh, I mean, as long as you are building on a, like a, a specific device um, and which device you are building on, it's changed from one to another. If it's really high fidelity, like Vario or other headsets, Unreal can be also an option. Any, anyone who would like to comment quickly? I would just say for everyone out here, um, don't pay attention to just the, the the engine, but also pay attention to the community and the libraries behind it. Unreal has really secured the virtual production. So think Mandalorian, but as far as like open source libraries and free utilities and assets for building VR, most of that stuff still tends to be in Unity today. So I, I would say it's kind of based on your end goal, which if it's VR or XR, still unity kind of has the edge but uh i don't know steven do you have a opinion on that um personally i have a lot more experience in unity than unreal uh but from what i've seen uh i think there is parity in terms of like the presence platform features between the two but oftentimes the not unity is the first to introduce uh the new features so if you're wanting to be up on the latest and greatest features of uh, 
the headset, then Unity is probably the way to go. But um, it's definitely a choice. Uh... Perfect. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let's continue with the next one. Um, I was just wondering if you have any updates on whether Target Tracker will be available on Quest 3. Yeah, this is meta question that we didn't answer, but I don't know if anyone knows. Target Tracker is this, like this HTC Vive tracker type of thing? Target Tracker or? Yeah, no, it's a... about QR codes, right? Or Sean, go ahead. Ah, Target yeah. Tracker, okay. QR codes or image recognition. Okay. Uh, I think those are honestly very powerful features for any XR device. I know like AR, like mobile AR devices, that's like the key component of it is being able to recognize an image or a QR code. Uh, as far as I'm aware, nothing on the roadmap for that uh, that I've seen, but you know, uh, that could change at any time. But yeah, there's nothing on the roadmap that I'm aware of. How about real object and surface detection when it comes to small scale objects instead of an entire room? Have you? I, yeah, same same thing. I would say that's you know equally as far out. Uh, now that we do have meshing for Quest Three, I can see some third party uh, providers offering that kind of object detection capability, maybe, but I, I don't think there's anything officially on the roadmap for that. Yeah, for both the target tracking um, and for objects with small details, you really need the video feed because um, you really need like the the video, the texture detail of the object. And unfortunately, right now, Meta, um, from a privacy standpoint, has not enabled applications to access the video feeds from the camera. So I would definitely recommend going into Meta's forums and, you know, kind of like posting scenarios that you would need those capabilities for. Um, and just to try to give them signal on where they should prioritize that in their roadmap. Perfect. So yeah. are there any frequently used plugins or API libraries uh, for the development process? They are asking, I mean, presence platform for sure, XR interaction toolkit we said, but anything else that you want to spotlight? Like other SDKs, you mean? Any SDK or any, exactly. There's there's a lot out there. I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Mixed Reality Toolkit, uh, you know, MRTK3. Uh, but yeah, there's there's quite a few out there. You know, there's a ton on the asset store. If you were to look a bunch of, you know, XR, <laughs> you know, hand tracking packages and this and that. I, I don't have much experience with those, but I do see they have a lot of reviews and users. But yeah, I would say the big ones for me are XRI, uh, uh, the meta presence platform, you know, and then uh, mixed reality toolkit. Yeah, and for those who don't know, MRTK3 was rewritten to just sit on top of XRI. So if you're already bought into XRI, you can basically use the MRTK3 stuff for free as well. Uh, how did your team handle playtesting and critics during development? Was it a mass table meeting once a week or after certain things were accomplished? Let's answer that from a uh, studio perspective. Uh, who would like to answer, Steve or Sean? Like how you are handling the testing. Let's say GorillaZilla, of course, we have been doing uh, together in a, a tight uh, sprint, but generally, how does it work for yeah. a typical studio? I, I think there's two, I, you know, I think every studio has their own process, but I'll speak a little bit to mine. I think it's a combination of automated testing uh you know as much as you can and then of course a manual qa qc process uh, so for the manual process we usually have a team that you know upon every build uh, of the application they'll go through you know see kind of have a spreadsheet of things they're supposed to test and test all the different scenarios and then try to break it if you can and then report uh bugs into a bug reporter and then the devs would then kind of tackle those one at a time. So that's that's kind of our process, but yeah, every every studio might have a slightly different process. Yep, I, I'd also recommend to share with friends and family. I, I know not everyone has headsets, but it's great to get people's reactions early on, not just for testing, but also, or like bug tracking, but also just like user experience and trying to figure out what yeah. works, what doesn't. Um, I know for App Lab, even if you aren't pushing out the app uh, quite yet, there is a feature where you can um, 
distribute your app uh, to friends and families through a little URL um, that they just click the link and it'll automatically download the app. And they'll also be prompted to uh, record video and submit any bugs that they find along their way, which is a great feature. Yeah. But plus one to what Steve said, because for some reason, uh, developers have a really hard time finding bugs. QA, QC people may be second place, but uh, friends and family and regular users, they somehow can find the most rare bugs that you could never find otherwise. <laughs> Perfect. Are you using Blender to build the 3D assets? Unity of uh, VFX assets? Can you go over this part of the workflow? Maybe you can also mention a little bit about how much Unity assets store or third party assets versus you handling uh, Blender. I will give pass to the Steve. He's the guy yeah. who is always creating or finding a way to create. <laughs> so for the project, we first started off uh, trying to find just a generic building model online. Um, this wasn't what officially got uh, pushed out to the store, but um, we we found uh, there's Kinney's assets for those of y'all that are familiar, it has a large library of different stuff. Um, but for our use case, whenever you're destroying the buildings, we had to also split them into chunks. And there's not a whole lot of models online that come in chunks. so. Um, there's a feature in Blender, um, there's a plugin that will, uh, I forget the name of it, I think it's like Cellulize or something like that, that will split uh, models up into different chunks that we ended up using. And then um, after that, uh, uh, Fairhan and XR Bootcamp helped out, uh, uh, specifically uh, Roger from um, Holonautics team uh, helped work on the rest of the models and the art for for the, the rest of the course. I believe they probably use Blender, but I'm I'm not familiar with their their art flow. Perfect. Let's continue. Um the text of text to speech is in connecting real time with an a AI API, sorry. Uh, the because... uh Text to speech. So right now, yeah, it's using the voice SDK, which uh, one of the limitations with the voice SDK is that you have to be connected to the internet because it's using an API to call into their servers to be able to um, hold down the information that it needs to use. Um, but it's also super powerful. It's not just text to speech, but also speech to text and language recognition, and a bunch of other features. Perfect. Yeah, that's. Something yeah, to point out there is that with it being cloud-based, you're not using application and device resources to do that processing. So while you have to be online, you do have trade-offs there. And the intent recognition, I think, is one of the most powerful things that there is. Um, you know, other devices have had voice commands, but you had to re remember the exact voice commands. And if you go through the time to train a learning model, um, which the Meta Voice SDK provides, you can allow users to be very fluent in what they say and kind of say it their own way and the app will still understand what you're saying. So those are some meaningful reasons why it's kind of uh, worth taking the cloud service. It's also free. Um, and by the way, they, they don't talk about this, but it's not um, the way that Meta wrote the voice SDK. Uh, it, I believe it should work whether you're using the Oculus Interaction SDK or, um, X, or XRI. So it's, it's a very flexible SDK. I, I believe it doesn't even have to be shipped onto a Quest headset. I believe it's uh, just Unity agnostic. So yeah, it's cool. Perfect. Uh, if I have a prototype for more B two B type of product, is there an accelerator advisory Meta can help bring it to marketplace? We already talk about that. Start program is perfect. Just uh, some tip for you. I would say you have more chance if you have a non gaming application. Recently, I would say it's just a, a small tip for you. If you have, especially B two B type of product, not maybe direct enterprise, but it's think, imagine like if you have a, some use case that can maybe affect 30, 50 million people's daily life, workflow or anything, uh, uh, even on a living room or in a, a normal daily environment. I think this is the way that you can have quite a bit of interest of uh, Meta, okay? Because we are joining a lot of hackathons. We have a lot of discussions. So 
this is a very uh, i think nice tip that i can share with you so you can actually plan your um, strategy accordingly uh, we are happy to discuss these kind of things in the future um, sessions as well very important question for the course do you need quest 3 for this course can it be done with quest 2 can it be done with quest pro if so how should i uh, what should i expect if i have these devices sure so uh definitely uh quest 3 is recommended if you have a quest 2 or a quest pro uh you can still do the course but there's a few things to watch out for one is the quest 2 and the quest pro don't have meshing so that part of the course uh won't work uh, uh we i don't think we have any specific instructions uh in the course for meshing it's just part of the code base uh, uh and then the other thing is if there are any instructions in the course related to quest 3 specific capabilities like for example when you're setting up your room uh i think we talk about it automatically scanning your room and automatically knowing where your walls are that's a quest 3 only feature with the quest 2 you have to manually show where your walls are you have to manually build your walls uh, in the quest 2 and also the quest uh, pro as well but other than those minor details here and there uh, if you're comfortable kind of knowing uh, how to overcome those then yeah you can use a quest 2 or a quest pro wonderful um for some people who ask uh, udemy and the free access to this udemy course please do not pay for udemy it's just the udemy's policy uh, we have a free code uh, like a 100 percent discount code so you can access for free our team will share again so you can have uh, the course access now and i want to uh, give some kind of like a uh, time for sean because he will start the office hour and uh, maybe you can give a, a little bit of break sean uh, because you will continue with the uh, with the office hours, uh, so we will probably start in the next 10-15 minutes, okay? Uh, we will handle the rest of the questions uh, with the rest of the team. Thank you, Sean, first of all, to make this course uh, uh, like a, a very nicely, um, I would say, uh, accessible for many people, even for people who have not built anything on Unity before. We are hearing comments that they can even take the course and follow along so thank you for for uh, making this happen with, along with jared and rest of the team uh, so again 10 15 minutes later uh, we will start the office hour uh, for those who would like to ask questions hands-on questions this time uh, on udemy uh, course or any meta presence platform stuff we will be happy to start answering questions and the only thing that our team is figuring out should we continue through this zoom or should we open the Zoom chat that we have already uh, done? So this is something that uh, maybe you can raise your hand so we can see if you want to continue with this Zoom so you don't need to open another. Just raise your hand so we will see how many people are uh, wanting to continue with the office hours through this Zoom. Uh, yeah, Sean, uh, we will see you probably in 10 minutes, okay? Let's okay. continue the rest of the course. Thank you again, Sean. Uh, do you need, uh, sorry, uh, can we transfer apps built using the meta all-in-one SDK to Vision OS? Okay, this is question of the day. Uh, yeah, it is so uh, so good, too good to be true, I would say, for today. Uh, maybe uh, it will change. Of course, Apple Vision is coming soon. Any comments or no comments? Jared, Steve. Um, so I, I do know that they are, uh, I haven't, really worked with the Apple Vision uh, myself, so I, I can't, not a source of truth here. I do know that they have their own um, SDK for developing onto their app, which I believe doesn't have direct support, especially with the, the all-in-one meta presence platform one. Um, but I do believe they are partnered with Unity for uh, their, um, I, I forget the name of it, Maybe Jared could uh, help uh, here. It's uh, yeah. the AR something. Um, there's kind of oh. um, there's kind of two different like modes for the Vision Pro, and I'm gonna be a little bit careful about what I say. But there's the um, immersive. There's like an immersive mode where 
it's for virtual reality only and your app is exclusive and kind of takes over the device. And for anybody that's developed a VR app, um, Unity should work in that context. It'll be very familiar. You'll be able to use familiar tooling. There is a different mode, which is the mixed reality mode, um, the polyspatial mode. Thanks, Marcus, for putting that, that word in there. Um, and I don't want to get ahead of announcing what their capabilities are. There will be uh, the ability to use some familiar tooling, but there's also some very interesting things being done by the operating system to allow um, kind of more than one app to be running at the same time. And so that may place some interesting constraints on, on the, the developer tooling. So uh, if you're a pure VR app, I think you're going to mostly be okay. Um, if you're going to the polyspatial, you may end up needing to make some changes and uh, not announcing anything here, but hopefully XR Bootcamp will have a course where we could teach people how to do that in the not too distant future. Yeah, exactly. If everything is less friction, I mean, uh, now a little bit uh, still friction, but in one month, I think we will have all better idea when we have full hands-on access to Vision Pro. Um, all of, I think this is a very nice question for you, Jared. All of these Quest 3 presence features remind me of Magic Leap and HoloLens capabilities in a great way. Did Meta license some of the spatial mapping tech from Magic Leap? Um, Jared was working at Microsoft for a long time, so maybe Jared is... Yeah, I worked on first. HoloLens for seven years. Um, no, I don't think Meta licensed anything specifically. The the um, the technique is called SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping, um, and that's you know looking around a space and finding feature points and tracking those things. Um, different manufacturers have done that. When Microsoft built it, they built it from scratch, and that's one of the reasons why they made their own custom silicone. Um, now these days, that kind of da data and processing is off the shelf commodity. Qualcomm has that in, you know, the chips that they sell. So, no, I don't think uh, Meta licensed it. But what I will say is that um, I am super happy to see a device that has things like scene understanding, uh, meshing, uh, facial track, or not facial tracking, but all of those kind of spatial capabilities that were only possible on the HoloLens or on Magic Leap. Now we have a on a five hundred dollar device. Um, it's pass through, but it's pass through is shockingly good, and um, I see a real opportunity to bring some applications that were previously only available to enterprises with big big budgets um, out to the the consumer sector, and I I think that's awesome. So long winded answer, no, I don't think they bought the tech, but I think we are seeing like a moment in time where we're starting to get those premium capabilities that are really needed for these kinds of experiences. Jamie is also answering very nicely. He's also one of our mentors uh, on the chat. So feel free to check that as well. And I also agree with Richard's uh, comment. Quest 3 is the best headset for Apple Vision Pro prototyping, at least for now. At least most accessible, we can definitely say. Uh, Quest, Quest 3, maybe also Quest Pro as well, because Keep in mind that gaze and pinch is the like backbone of every interaction in uh, Apple Vision Pro, and you need an eye tracking for that. So I would prefer Quest Pro if you really want to have much more closer um, hardware capabilities. Uh, definitely, I mean, especially from mixed reality perspective, uh, don't wait to to effort <clears throat> Vision Pro. Just start exploring with uh, Vision Pro. Um, very important question. How long do you estimate this course will be alive until it becomes deprecated because fast moving tech and new SDK updates? Uh, Valdemar, you are uh, touching to our one of the most um, long lasting pain points. This is actually why we have uh, quite a bit of like a lot of um, effort as a team. That's why there are over 10 people worked on this course. That's why we continue working on this course because even during the course production, you cannot imagine how many times that the things uh, change. So it is very difficult or very brave to build any course on Quest 3 or Vision Pro. Uh, we are just trying to make it as possible, ready as possible, as much as we can. 
but it's not like a YouTube YouTube uh, tutorial, right? Like you are not only focusing one thing and there's a game attached to this course, right? So everything should be in piece. So if you change one moving piece, you need to create everything. So Jared and the team well, have been doing an amazing job to make this happen. Uh, we will do our best as long as, of course, XR top XR platforms support us. We are also doing uh, different courses for other platforms. We will continue making it alive, right? Uh, it may not be up to date, like you may not expect that uh, one week ago and then the update comes that the course will be immediately updating itself, but we will do uh, our best to make it um, like industry standard. Uh, and we are the only course creator, especially also official course creator. So we have to do that as well. Um, but uh, this takes quite a bit of time to, to align accordingly. Uh, let's say we are committed and also XR platform partners that we are working with are committed. Um, so it will be a definitely a long lasting for sure. Meta SDK bug for text mesh pro for uh, Cody wrote that so uh, we can maybe uh, take it and share with Meta team. Um, where can we find project details for the Wonder Room demo on the campfire shown earlier? Anyone knows uh, Wonder Room, how we can access? Maybe we can um, also look at that later. That, that's the first time I've, I've seen that demo, so I'm not aware, but uh can definitely reach back out to, to Winston or yeah, yeah, we will, ask, we will ask definitely Meta team. Will the Meta XR toolkit continue to work with the free version of Unity? We already uh, get the good news from Meta team, so no uh, concerns. Regarding outdoors, are there any plans to anchor objects to the outdoor place like with Google AR Core? Um, yeah, as being mentioned, it's not an outdoor first device, um, but imagine that there are also other devices lineups coming up so um it's not only uh quest so with rayban and others eventually we will probably see something outdoor related from meta and other companies even from uh, apple as well um what methods have worked best for you all when introducing people to the quest if you are asking from an end user perspective, I think uh, it's quite easy. Just show first encounters. But if you are asking from a developer, how you are introducing developers to the quest, what is our best uh, strategy, Jared or Steve? That I will be. That makes me as a developer excited to build for quest. I <laughs> think. What, yep. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> sure. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I mean, if we're talking about, I guess, whether it's developers or users, um, just some of the like premium demos that the, that Meta has in the store, like the first hands demo and, um, the, the first encounters demos, those are very kind of eye opening because like the first encounters one is where it scans your room. You can shoot through the walls. Creatures are coming into your home and bouncing on your couch. Stuff is falling through your ceiling. That's the first time that um, people really get to experience kind of the magic of what a, would have previously required a HoloLens device or a Magic Leap device. So that's a great way to get people excited quickly. Um, but I don't know. That That's my thoughts. Steven? Yeah, I, I think you kind of hit the hammer on the the nail um just showing examples of great mixed reality games and prototypes and different stuff that actually utilizes the tech and for me that's what gets me excited to develop is seeing inspiration from others perfect um is there any possibility to create hand tracking for smartphones for basic or for for basic 20 dollars vr ar headsets I mean, there's actually some kind of like a hand tracking apps that you can try, but yeah, the fidelity is not easy. And how does it work, right? You have one hand and then uh, this um, smartphone for maybe basic headsets still. Um, yeah. Um, any, I, I wouldn't any, necessarily, any idea? I don't know that I would try to add hand tracking on a phone that would be hard maybe you could find some kind of vision library that would allow you to do that but 
One thing I will say is in the latest release of the XR Interaction Toolkit, they added a lot of things to try to blend, uh, better blend air foundation with XRI, right? So better support for like touchscreen pass through and things of that nature. Um, when you're trying to target AR on a phone, remember you've got you've got a window into the world and your whole control surface is very, very small. And so I think you have to really think about the design for that experience and really target that form factor. I don't know that you can really successfully get away with taking a headset based XR experience and just trying to put it on a phone as is. I think it it needs some thought. I I think he they might also be um thinking that like putting the headset how we used to have uh, the Gear VR or whatever um yeah. which I, on the yeah phone, exactly right? yeah. which I honestly haven't seen much in that space uh going going down but i do remember early things of hand tracking with with that stuff so i know it's possible it's just um definitely not explored as as much um one important question about the course about mac we already talked about that mac is not the ideal environment for uh, quest development or any vr development uh, because you cannot real time uh, see what you are building on Unity, um, but from a accessibility perspective, I think this course is quite um, like if you have limited Unity knowledge, you can still follow along. So you just need to carefully follow along this course. Uh, if you, but we of course recommend that you first understand a little bit of Unity, a little bit of C sharp. Jared, what's your take on that or advice? Yeah, actually, I was raising my hand because I wanted it to answer two of the questions in the QA panel. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Yeah, so the first one is, has anyone used something like MRT, MRTK together with the Presence platform? And this is honestly why I jumped in and asked the question the way that I asked it earlier, because unfortunately, when you use the Meta Interaction SDK, although it is built on top of OpenXR, um, the Meta Interaction SDK is not compatible with XRI. So Meta SDK has the concept of array interactor and grabbable, and, open, and XRI has the concept of array interactor and a grabbable, and they are not the two, they're not the same thing, okay? So when you're building an app for the MetaQuest, you have to decide, am I, am I going with Oculus Interaction SDK or am I going with XRI? And there's not a good way of mixing those two things together today. So if you did, um, if you went down the path of XRI, um, then absolutely you can bring in MRTK, no problem. But you're not going to have some of the awesome things that we talked about today, like the scene understanding block or um, you know the body, the body tracking block. So unfortunately today, those are decisions that you have to make early on. And I really hope that that interactivity kind of converges at some point in the future. And I'm um, going to add a little bit to that as well, um, saying that the presence platform and the interaction SDK are two separate things as well. Um, so a lot of the features from the headset, from like the scene understanding and body tracking can definitely be done uh, outside with any other package. It's just all those uh, specific building blocks that have been set up to be able to do it easily is not available, unfortunately. And then there was a question about the voice SDK, which is, could you essentially build a language from scratch for a game like spells and other things? And yeah, I think you could. Um, that's the what the purposes of the intents are. So where, where a voice command might be like, open the door, think of intents like ordering a pizza. And to order a pizza, you'd be like, I want a large and I want pepperoni and bacon. Oh, wait, no, take off the bacon, add mushrooms. The, the ingredients are part of an intent. The size of the pizza is, is part of the, the, the utterance. And then giving the person the ability to say that in a free form way um, is what an intent system does. So a spell system could be like, you know, what are the, what are the ingredients? What are you casting? How are you saying it? Um, and absolutely, that's possible with a voice SDK. I will say, I think the language model that it's trained on is based off of languages like English and Spanish and whatnot. So I'm not sure if like 
coming up with your own language per se, like brand new words yeah. like gobbledygook or whatever. I don't know if it will uh, pick up on that, but um, other English words will definitely be able to pick up for on. sure. Uh, by the way, we are about to finish. We have only a few minutes left. Uh, we will about to share the Zoom link uh, for for the office hour for those who would like to continue uh, with the Udemy related or MetaPresence platform related hands-on questions that you can even share screen. Uh, it will be a meeting, so uh, it will be a little bit um, different than this because now we are doing webinar. Just to keep in mind that we will uh, share the link in a few minutes. So. Um, which questions that you left, um, Jared? I answered both of them already. Okay, so any left questions? I mean, Mac Air Link, you answered already? No, I didn't answer that one, but that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You're not going to be able to do Air Link on Mac because you can't do Link on Mac. That's missing the the Quest application and those those platform features, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Um, I think uh, we are all good, right? Um, the, all the questions being answered, speech recognition, anything that you want yeah, to add? Well, does it work? Um, I've only tried it on the MetaQuest 3, um, it, and it, to, in, as far as I'm concerned, it worked pretty well. I, Steve, I don't know if you have more extensive experience with it, but I didn't have issues with it struggling to understand me or anything. Yeah, uh, it's fairly powerful. Um has a bunch of different features as well uh so it's not just intense but as well as like i think they're mixing in some features of not chat gpt necessarily but being able to have like a conversation with the ai in the game should be possible that there's a voice crack but <laughs> ignore that um but yeah it should be fairly uh powerful enough to work for for most applications. And that's a good point that there is not only the intent version, but there is the um, dictation. So you can do continuous speech input and have that converted to text as well. Cool. Perfect. So uh, we are about to finish. Actually, this is the office hour Zoom link. Unfortunately, you need to copy here and then uh, somewhere and then uh, save it somewhere so that you can keep it because whenever we close the zoom uh, it will it may go so um just uh, take the copy the link and then uh, just afterwards close this zoom and then open the next one for those who who has questions and for those who already gone through the udemy course at least up to some point uh thanks everyone for this two hours long of uh, open lecture plus q a Thanks to our team as well. Jared already got a lot of uh, attention from the audience. He becomes, uh, he's already our hero. Now it becomes also hero of uh, others as well. So that's great. Uh, we will be together, uh, everyone. Like you uh, don't worry that we will, um, we, it is not the last event that we are doing. We will have lots of open lectures and we have also masterminds like Steve who is building stuff and interesting stuff. So I'm sure we have tons of stuff that we will get uh, from their um, uh, post-mortems and their projects. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and being with us for two hours. For those who have still energy left, we are continuing with the office hour. The office hours will continue. We will probably do a few more uh, in the uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and also at MIT, again, Jared will be there with us. Uh, at MIT, we will have um, in-person workshops with Meta team. If you can make it to Boston and you are selected, we will definitely see you in person. Thanks everyone and see you at uh, the next event or MIT hack. We have tons of events uh, coming up this month and uh, hope we can see you each other. Uh, thanks everyone. Thanks Jared, Steve. Okay. See you in the office hour. <laughs>